And so to begin our show, uh, I, I just present, I just say a few words about Diego Saglia, who is a professor of English literature at the University of Parma, and his research concentrates on British romantic literature and culture, with particular attention to their links and exchanges with continental European traditions. He is a member and current director of Italy's Inter-University Center for the Study of Romanticism, and sits on the advisory committee of the Museo Byron in Ravenna. His latest monographs are European Literatures in Britain from 1815 to 1832, Romantic Translations, and Modernità del Romanticismo, Scrittura e Cambiamento nella Letteratura Britannica, 1780-1830. I give the floor to Professor Sai, and I shift and switch back places. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Enrico. Uh, I have to say that uh, when a uh, specialist in Portuguese studies and a trained philologist comes to me and says, there is this thing, we don't know what it is, uh, it's exciting, it's potentially exciting, and I said, well, why are you coming to, to me, someone who works in English literature from a completely different period? I've got no idea of sort of philological procedures or things like that. At first I thought, well, I'll just smile and uh, wave and send him out. Uh, and then maybe well, we can talk about it, you know, postponing. But then Enrico can be very convincing, as, as you can see. So uh, really, I, I first, uh, first of all, I'd like to start by saying that um, you have seen something. There is potential in here. And so thanks for uh, inviting me along and also for giving us this very clear presentation of uh, well, the state of the art, what we are going to do today, but also at the same time uh, sketching out the convergence of ex types of expertise that are needed for this absolutely daunting and challenging and very scary uh, thing that we are beginning to glimpse uh, today. So, excitement, uh, absolutely, because as I said earlier, it's like going into a black hole, and uh, so we are definitely explorers. Uh, the Duke comes to Parma, the Duke has come to Parma. This was one of the uh, ideas that we had when we started uh, talking about this. Uh, but as you can see, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you somewhere else completely. So, away from Parma, we're going uh, to, to Britain. Um, this paper is, like I hope all the other papers will be today, is very much on the hoof, as they say. It's uh, a tentative experiment, uh, very exploratory. Uh, the main tense here is the conditional tense, especially the past conditional. Uh, and it's going to be a contextual um, contribution. So. Uh, it's very good that I've been put here at the start, not because of sort of uh, any uh, special stuff I've got to say to you, but because this will be very generally introduct introductory and contextualizing, and then the specialists will move in with their more sort of in-depth um, explorations later. Um, we all have uh, abstracts here, so I won't repeat what the general gist of what I'm going to say is. You, you, you can use the abstract and also Friends who are far away will be able to look at the abstracts online, won't they? Um, I'm going to try and talk about one of the possible backdrops. Uh, and again, I'm really pleased that Enrico, in his uh, beautiful introduction, talks about uh, Zenith's biography and the sort of uh, sparks of light he introduces in the section he dedicates to the Duke of Parma, because... Um, Zenith, very interestingly, and probably also very obviously, uh, concentrates on Shakespeare. Uh, and again, it's, it's almost self-understood that Shakespeare should be there uh, at uh, some point. Um, I'm no Shakespearean, uh, um, and I won't do any source hunting today. We have identified a few Shakespearean scholars who might, at the right time, come into all of this and, and uh, help us. Um, finding some, some bearings, some orientations. But I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to uh, sketch out a slightly different type of background where Shakespeare comes in, but where he is just one voice among many other voices. 
so uh, try to look at uh, another possible series. I wouldn't even call them hypotexts, but more like a general atmosphere, a more general environment. I also found very interesting um, when earlier you mentioned those two, let's say, termini, Macbeth and Hamlet, and it's absolutely fascinating because Macbeth is the shortest tragedy and Hamlet is the longest tragedy. So trying to place himself between these two, sort of oscillating between these two extremes has got something to do with that. Also, um, the question of, uh, yeah, various plays were mentioned. I was surprised that Measure for Measure was not uh, called up because it's a play about sex and chastity, uh, the problems of morality and things like that. But anyway, going back to this possible backdrop for the Duke, neo-Renaissance drama in 19th century Britain. What I'd like to uh, suggest in the time I have before the break is that we also, right at the start, right now, when we know practically, well, very little, can I say it, although you've given us all the bits of information that we definitely have, at the start of everything, when we don't know very much about this, this text, uh, Let's also consider it as a neo-Renaissance or neo-Elizabethan work. And these are labels that refer to those plays produced uh, consecutively in 19th century Britain on the model of the language, the diction, the style, the meter, but also the themes, the situations, the settings, uh, the stage strategies of 16th and early 17th century English theatre. So the Duke is evidently steeped in Shakespeare, but so were the neo-Renaissance plays that appeared uh, in print, but also on stage, in the 19th century, from the beginning until the end, in, in Britain. Um, these authors, and I'll give you a tentative list later, uh, drew on early modern playwrights that were coming back into fashion and not just on, on Shakespeare. So could this tradition that was so significant uh, in 19th century British theatre also represent possibly at this point, I won't say another source, as we need to do a lot more work uh, in that department, but could they represent also another uh, backdrop environment context for the Duke? or perhaps more generally uh, a development, a cultural development in uh, British uh, um, theatre history and drama history that he was aware of, that he might have read about uh, in uh, the periodical press, for instance, even if he didn't have access to any of the plays I will be talking about, that he was aware of and that possibly motivated his project. Um, when we think about this type of drama, one obvious instance is, uh, there are many obvious instances, I'll just give you perhaps the most obvious one, Shelley's The Cenci. Um, there are significant plays like this one that belong to this line of development. However, this kind of tradition, the neo-Renaissance drama, has not received any systematic treatment yet. Histories of 19th century British drama and theatre rarely deal with these works, sometimes in sort of scattered fashion and mostly in dismissive terms. They started being dismissed right from the time they started appearing, so late 18th century, early 19th century. Mostly we have to resort to rather old studies to uh, find some kind of orientation. So, I'm also grateful to the project because it's enabled me to actually go back to something I'd wanted to do for quite some time. Uh, working on Shelley, Byron, the female playwrights from the period, I'd always come across this, this type of drama and theatre, but I'd always looked for some kind of more systematised approach to it, couldn't find it. So, again, part of this exploratory work has been uh, uh, getting back to all of this and trying to sort of as I said, sketch out uh, this field. Mostly rather old uh, studies. Uh, I'll, I'll start from this one here, 1936. Uh, reasons. Um, 19th century British drama, as you can imagine, has never been uh, uh, flavour of the month with uh, uh, scholars of uh, theatre and drama in the English tradition. Uh, squashed between uh, what we can call the long renaissance 
from the middle of the 16th century to the middle of the 17th century. And then with uh, uh, the uh, enormous production of the 20th century, the middle eras, apart probably from restoration theatre, have never been very, very popular. Um, also, a lot of these plays from the 19th century have been treated as uh, literature. So uh, scholars working on Byron uh, or Shelley uh, have treated them basically not as dramatic texts per se, not as, as let's say, stage-worthy uh, texts, but more in terms of the general literary output of, of these authors. Uh, also, many of these plays were uh, what we generally call closet drama, or sometimes they're sort of referred to as the stillborn drama, because they didn't make it to the stage. So from that point of view, theatre historians and theatre scholars were a lot less interested in them. But someone like Ernest Reynolds, in this book on early Victorian drama, 1830-1870, came out in 1936, so it has all the disadvantages of of, of a, a book uh, from a not very popular, about a not very popular type of drama and theatre published at a time when archival research would be very complicated in this type of, 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 of topic. However, uh, Reynolds dedicates a section to uh, neo-Elizabethan drama. He says that there is an enormous mass of these plays and it's one of the main subdivisions that he focuses on for drama and theatre between 1830 and 1870. He highlights the role of certain uh, authors, to which I will refer uh, in, in a little while, uh, analyses their plays, provides the plot, but of this enormous mass, he only concentrates on just a selected few. But he has some interesting pointers, like uh, this sentence here, which he just drops in this kind of very scattered, very unfocused treatment. He says, Poetic dramatists, having established the Elizabethans as their models, seemed to be incapable of unbending from their lofty heights. So they aimed very high and they could never sort of recalibrate uh, their style, their language, their structures to produce, implicitly, uh, Reynolds seems to be saying, better plays. Um, he um, concentrates, as I said, on, on a series of selected authors, choosing them, I suppose, according to the sources that he could lay his hands on. But here and there, in this mm, short section of a chapter, there are also some other interesting pointers, and these two I will go back to at the very end of my talk. He also um, remarks that in trying to, to aim very high, uh, pointing to the Elizabethan dramatists, he cannot help referring to what he calls the fact that these authors fell for the temptations of melodrama. And some of these plays for him constitute almost pure melodrama. Melodrama, obviously, in the way that this term applies to uh, 19th century British theatre, which has got nothing to do with opera. Um, If we move uh, a little bit uh, um, further in time to this other work, which is specifically about English romantic drama, came out in 1966, again, like Reynolds's book, with a very minor American publisher. So also the fact that this research could not find an outlet in important publishing houses like the university presses of the time, the traditional ones, uh, Chicago, Columbia, Oxford, Cambridge, and things like that, also tells us something about the fact that this type of uh, theatre, this type of topic, was uh, overlooked for all sorts of reasons. F Fletcher seems to be uh, picking up on uh, one of Reynolds's ideas, uh, implicit in Reynolds, the uh, fact that during the 19th century there is a real need for this type of drama, what Fletcher rebaptizes as the urge to Elizabethanize. Um, he also tries to contextualize historically, culturally, this type of phenomenon. He talks about the fact that these playwrights who produced neo Elizabethan drama, writing in, a, in an age of turbulent reaction and later liberalism, they were seeking to express the changes as well as they knew how. 
while using the materials seemingly best suited dramatically for this task. Um, he uh, mentions the fact that at this point in time in the early 19th century, Elizabethan playwrights, apart from Shakespeare, were being rediscovered. Uh, there were anthologies, there were uh, critical essays, there were um, critical editions as well of, of many of these authors. Uh, and at the same time, there were plays that were being written on, on these models. He focuses particularly on Shelley and the Cenci, obviously. But uh, this type of drama, he considers uh, absolutely, without appeal, a dead end. And uh, let's say more established scholars like this gentleman here, uh, one of the fundamental historians of uh, English drama and theatre, uh, uh, Allardyce Nicholl had a long life and, and was extremely active in the fourth volume of his History of English Drama that uh, came out in, in 1930. So we're more or less at the same time, but then he kept on revising and added to it. Uh, let's say that the, the stable version of this uh, fundamental history of English drama came out in the 1960s. Again, he doesn't have many uh, sort of kind words for this type of theatre. He talks about the dead hand of Elizabethanism, the evil influence of the Elizabethans, the deadly disease of Elizabeth. He liked uh, playing with these words, playing with this sort of almost necrophiliac uh, uh, language, the deadly disease, or, or with this kind of satanic language, the evil influence of the Elizabethans. Um, He also, to support this kind of approach to this type of drama, which he cannot ignore, but at the same time has to talk about it, but doesn't really want to get into it, he quotes a, a letter, an excerpt from a letter mm, written in 1825 by one of these neo-Elizabethans, Thomas Lovell Beddoes, who uh, was one of the most sort of determined purveyors of neo-Renaissance plays, but at the same time he was aware of the limitations. So again, there's this kind of need to write this type of play, but a, a very clear awareness of uh, the, the, the shortcomings of where this could go. I am convinced the man who is to awaken the drama must be a bold trampling fellow, no creeper into wormholes, no reviser even, however good. These reanimations are vampire cold. Such ghosts as Marlowe, Webster, etc. are better dramatists, better poets, I dare say, I dare say than any contemporary of ours, but they are ghosts. The worm is in their pages. And we want to see something that our great-grandsires did not know. With the greatest reverence for all the antiquities of the drama, I still think that we had better beget than revive. Attempt to give the literature of this age an idiosyncrasy and spirit of its own and only raise a ghost to gaze on, not to live with. Just now, the drama is a haunted ruin. This is a very famous letter and the definition of the drama as a haunted ruin has been used even by some more recent scholars to talk about the crisis of the drama at this time, which is a crisis that uh, we have to work with, obviously. Um, there is an ambivalence in here. Um, an ambivalence, however, which does not hide the fact that countless plays that we can consider to be neo-Elizabethan, neo-Renaissance, were written, and many of them were staged, so I'm not going to go through this, and this is also extremely incomplete, obviously, uh, but some of these plays were staged, and I've uh, written the name of the theatre where they were performed, and they were not minor theatres, uh, there were some of the uh, secondary ones, but mostly uh, they were staged at Drury Lane and Covent Garden in uh, the Romantic years, and then in, at the Princess and other important theatres in Victorian times. Uh, let me see if there are any here that I'd like to say a couple of things. Well, of course, you've got Thomas Lovell Beddoes, who in 1822 writes and publishes The Bride's Tragedy, and it's one of his neo-Renaissance dramas, although then he uh, talks about uh, this drama in disparaging terms in his letter. I've put Byron in brackets because Byron 
doesn't follow Renaissance models, although obviously there are echoes of Shakespeare in all of these plays. Marino Faliero, the two Foscari, are the obvious examples. But he was inspired by Alfieri mostly, or at least he took Alfieri as his model and therefore neoclassical drama. Uh, also, um, that uh, Joseph and his Brethren, that was first published in 1824, I've sort of devoted a few more lines, a couple of lines to it, because then it was republished in 1876, so it returned in Victorian times. And I'll tell you a couple of things about it, and then we move on, the 1830s, uh, and then we've got the 1840s. Richard Hengist Horn, Gregory VII, I'm going to say a couple of things about him later. And then we've got Swinburne, with all of his neo-Elizabethan plays, Oscar Wilde, and then Swinburne again in, in 1908. And we get closer to uh, our period. Um, I'm also, just to give you a taster of the kind of language, style, um, kind of, again, also the meter of this type of drama, just read a very short uh, uh, monologue from John Roby's The Duke of Mantua. Uh, Mantua's very, I also chose it because it's very close to Parma, and uh, again, it's one of the early plays. Uh, it was successful, it was reviewed, not very nicely reviewed. Um, it was published anonymously, and this was the frontispiece, Duke of Mantua, a tragedy by, and then there is no name, and then of course you've got this very interesting illustration where basically you have Lord Byron uh, with this mask, half revealing, half concealing his face. The Duke of Mantua is one of those art clay works, which is basically about Byron's uh, life. Uh, it was published in 1823, a year before his death. It's one of those typical sort of Byronically inspired works that tried to get the interest of the public by seeming to reveal the dark, uh, shady sides of uh, Lord Byron's personality, character, scandals and everything. At the beginning of the second act, uh, we find uh, this um, uh, monologue by the Duke of Mantua, which again is a very adept, very uh, sort of successful uh, imitation of uh, Elizabethan Renaissance models. A strange conceit, where dwellest thou and on what nurtured? Love on air-fed dreams yet lives not, if in the heart nor hope there be, nor thought, nor tokened glimpse on which to cling for daily sustenance the recreant dies. Replies thou, what, naught, my monitor? He's talking to his conscience. So I chose it because it's one of those self-analytical moments which give a particular edge to this type of drama. Nay, thou didst rise unbidden on my path, with threatening front, and sternly stalked thee forth from out thy covert, sent forsooth, as though to warn of menace danger, back to thy den. And then it continues like this. Now, um, moving swiftly on, um, the 19th century is basically a period where this type of drama is produced and it's written about in, let's say, polemical, uh, let's say, dialogic ways. Uh, one of the uh, supporters, uh, one of the promoters of this type of drama was this uh, character, Richard Hengist Horn, who produced a number of tragedies, which are in my list earlier, about uh, especially Italian Renaissance settings written in that kind of style that I've just uh, exemplified for you. He wrote a tragedy on Cosmo de' Medici. He wrote a play on the death of Christopher Marlowe and then his play on Pope Gregory VII, which is particularly interesting for this preface on the, an, an essay on tragic influence, he calls it, where he analyzes the inevitability of going back to the great dramatists of the Elizabethan age. He definitely supports the need to recast tragedy, to create a new type of tragedy, and he says that it is inevitable to go back to all of these, uh, all of these models. But he also identifies a problem. The fact that these models are not sufficiently known yet, 1840, 
in, Brit in England, in Britain and in the English-speaking world, let alone across the Channel. The spirit and the genius that penetrated the heart of man, thanks to these uh, uh, playwrights, and could enclasp the stars, has not yet passed the English Channel. Uh, so he says that not only do we need to uh, keep cultivating these dramatists as models, but we also need to know them better, to reintegrate them into our own cultural sphere of the present. So he advocates a huge investment in this type of drama, which is important not just for archaeological or historical cultural reasons, but for the present, for the development of present day theatrical culture. Not so later, because when the poet and playwright Algernon Charles Swinburne, le uh, protagonist of, of later uh, sort of Victorian culture, when in 1876 he republishes Wells's Joseph and his Brethren, he does so precisely because this play that had come out decades before, he identifies it as a crucial moment in the history of dramatic Elizabethanizing, and he praises it precisely because Wells had a deep knowledge of all of these playwrights, Marlowe, Webster, Turner, Beaumont, Fletcher, etc., etc., and Shakespeare, of course, and can recycle all of them and re-propose them to, uh, the, uh, to the spectators, uh, the readers and the spectators of the present. He praises Wells specifically because of this successful example of neo-Elizabethanizing. He praises the author's lofty mastery of his own genius, but it's a genius that feeds on the Elizabethans. He finds in this play such wealth such wisdom in the use of it, such luxury and such forbearance of style, because they are in the highest Elizabethan manner. Um, Swinburne also wrote a Duke play. Obviously, the Duke plays are a huge number in 19th century uh, British theatre, printed or acted. The Duke of Gandia, or Duque de Gandia, we should say in, in Spanish, was published in 1908. This was a very popular theme uh, uh, with uh, writers on, on um, sort of Renaissance history, but also painters, so probably the last uh, famous hi historical painter in the Spanish tradition, José Monero, Moreno Carbonero, who wrote, uh, sorry, who painted La Conversión del Duque de Gandia uh, in 1884, it's now in the Prado, and then um, Swinburne's play, which is very interesting, but I'm going to skip uh, approaching also my conclusions because if Swinburne was a great promoter and a great defender of neo-Elizabethan drama, he actually saw it until the end of his career as the great way for serious tragedy, for serious drama and for tragedy to sort of re-establish itself and to keep talking to the public. Other voices did not see things exactly the same way. And one of uh, the most vocal was William Archer. Uh, so Elizabethan drama became an, a, a topic that was very hotly debated between the late 19th century and the early 20th century at a time when the question of the modernization of English language serious drama was very much a problem. Uh, there was this, this feeling that uh, the English dramatic tradition was lagging behind with comparison to places like France and Germany, but obviously even Scandinavia. This was the time when Ibsen came in and completely revolutionised in, in a very experimental way uh, the way that uh, theatre had to be conceived and imagined and reimagined. Archer was possibly... Uh, a, a one-man uh, Ibsenian industry. He continuously promoted Ibsen against the resistance of a very sort of conservative cultural milieu at the time. He was a journalist, a polemicist, he was a champion of modern uh, experimental drama, who died in 1924, as you can see there, and throughout his life constantly wrote against neo-Elizabethanism. For instance, in this uh, review 
which appeared in 1901. You see, we're getting closer to our interesting dates. Uh, published in the Pall Mall Gazette, he talks about this, this new play, Herod, by Stephen Phillips. And he says, applauding this play, we have here the first entirely vital, so not the dead hand of Elizabethanism, entirely vital dramatic poem the stage has seen for many a long day. No verbose or stodgy pseudo-Elizabethanism, no melodrama with its dialogue measured of into wooden decasyllables, but a drama which is poetic to the core and a poem which is dramatic to the fingertips. Here at last is the reunion of literature and the stage so plainly consummated that willful blindness alone can fail to recognise it. He went back to his onslaught against Elizabethan drama in one of his most interesting writings about uh, Theatre, The Old Drama and the New, published in 1923, a year before his death. Uh, this uh, book contains two uh, lectures, two, sorry, two courses of lectures uh, addressed to an audience of mainly teachers, instructors, uh, school instructors, university instructors, about drama, theatre, but especially the contrast between the old drama and also the not-so-old drama, the 19th century tradition, and the new, uh, the modern, the pre-modernist drama. He is very harshly critical against all retro modes in contemporary theatre. Um, for instance, he mentions this revival of Webster's The Duchess of Malfi by the Phoenix Society, uh, two days before his second lecture, and he finds that his own ideas about this play, about this revival, have been preempted by the critic of the reviewer of the Daily News. And he quotes the words of this reviewer appro uh, approvingly. He says, its performance, this revival of the Duchess of Malfi, will bring home to Plago as the hollowness of the old uncritical praise of the great Elizabethan dramatists. So not only does he attack uh, neo-Elizabethan drama, he also says that the Elizabethan playwrights, apart from Shakespeare, they were all overrated. Charles Lamb's, Charles Lamb was one of the people responsible in the early 19th century for drawing attention again, gentle enthusiasm and Swinburne's boisterous panegyrics have made a legend of Elizabethan drama not founded on fact as most critical students have known for a long time. So he basically puts everything together, everything in the same basket, Elizabethan drama, apart from Shakespeare, neo-Elizabethan drama, Swinburne as the great champion, all basically to the dogs. And the new Elizabethan drama, he talks about uh, of as sheer anachronism and an indication of the stagnation and puerility of contemporary. So, last few minutes, um, reflections on, and, and this is probably where, uh, I don't know, probably I, I call in another type of, of theatre that must be related to, uh, contrastively related to this type of phenomenon, and it's, it's basically melodrama, uh, which we have seen uh, has been mentioned regularly in all of these, um, in some of, of these interventions on neo-Elizabethan drama. Now, when we think about why this retro phenomenon during the entire span of the 19th century, I guess, and again here, speaking very much in the conditional, uh, it answered a series of needs, a series of sort of, mm, let's, let's call them cultural demands, uh, it was a way of ensuring that, uh, so neo-Elizabethan drama was a way of ensuring that drama and theatre would be in line with tradition. So uh, the, the, the weaker theatrical environment of the 19th century needed to look back to prestigious models. So the need for precedence, the need for a solid tradition. Uh, the 19th century was obviously also the age of cultural nationalism. All European cultures sought to establish a national school of poetry the English school of painting, the English school of drama. So there is an element of that in all of this. 
It also offered a way of upholding quality theatre uh, in contrast to pure spectacularity. Um, it was a way of empowering what was called legitimate drama and theatre against illegitimate spectacular uh, drama and theatre, which were obviously on, on the up and up. It was also a way of countering uh, the incredible cultural power and, and the pulling power also, we could call it, of bourgeois-themed drama and melodrama in particular, which was the great novelty uh, in 19th century British theatre, and it was a new, not only, obviously, it was an international phenomenon, but it was an irresistible force. Um, and here again, we go back to what Reynolds was saying, but also in particular to what Archer was saying about melodrama with its dialogue measured off into wooden decasyllables. So this probably offers yet another key to understand why there was this enormous um, sort of production of a type of drama which together with Shakespearean revivals or neo-Shakespearean plays creates what I would call this kind of incredible uh, archive peculiar to a British tradition that Pessoa was in constant contact with. Whether he was in contact with this type of, uh, uh, let's say, cultural production remains to be seen. So, countering the modes of melodrama, the retro modes of Renaissance-inspired theatre and drama, both Romantic and Victorian, was powered by a search for prestige, in the name of tradition and legitimacy, a search for originality over the formulaic of uh, nature of melodrama, in order to find alternative ways of dealing with themes as well, obviously, such as power and authority, sovereignty, intrigue and politics, sex and the gendering of identity, self-analysis, troubled psychologies, just as melodrama is a mode of facing modernity and its challenges, a mode that keeps regenerating itself well into the early 20th century among debates, polemics and oppositions, so too is neo-Elizabethan drama. And then we'll see if uh, what I've been going down is, a, again, a dead end or maybe it will lead somewhere. But uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, of sharing... Uh, this kind of slightly unknown uh, uh, part of 19th century British culture. Thank you very much. <laughs> Enrico, what shall we do now? <laughs> <laughs> First, I thank you for your very well, insightful analysis and valuable contribution thank to you. our research. And I think if there are any questions to for to Professor Salia, well, then, um, I, th I think we, we can still have a, a debate, not just at the finish of our okay. morning session. Okay, let's see. I'm also aware that there was a lot in this and that it was all over the place, as the phrase goes. Yeah. But, you know, if there's any sort of curiosity or, or anything... Veronica. Thank you. Well, two excellent presentations. Thank you so much. No, just a brief, brief note. I was really fascinated and I have to read much more about, uh, and I will talk a little about uh, Elizabethan drama. But Pessoa has in his personal library a book uh, by John McKinnon Robertson, William Archer, as a rationalist. So in 1925, he was reading about um, William Archer and uh, I mean, he was not reading him maybe as a critic, uh, or well, at, at the very end, he was reading him as a critic, uh, a theatrical critic, but uh, he was considering him as a rationalist when he was uh, writing on rationalism. So Thank there you. is going to be like a tension between these uh, uh, retro modes and Pessoa's uh, constant rationalism in his life. Thank you. Uh, it may be that in her uh, paper, Dr. Teresa Filippe will maybe hint at, at this because we have been in touch online before. So we've been doing our homework. 
And uh, Teresa, she spotted uh, the book by Archer that you mentioned and said, look, I don't know that one, but who knows, it might be a little link in the chain. Uh, and, and possibly, yes, it might not be connected with his interest in the retro mode, if, if ever there was this interest, but it may be connected with other aspects of his own intellectual formation and maybe it will link also to his theatrical experiments. So, um, Geronimo, thank you very much and uh, let's see what comes out of all of this. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, that uh, Pessoa wasn't very successful when he proposed his English works to, mm. to British uh, critics and editors. And you showed us that the critics were quite negative about this uh, neo-Renaissance uh, vogue. Uh, so what would they have thought if Pessoa uh, finished and proposed mm. this, this mm. kind of reprise well into the 20th century? Yeah, yeah. It's also something that's, uh, okay, okay, here we are in the what if uh, yeah. sort of dimension. But I guess that what I've been talking about also, and again, apologies, uh, I know Pessoa extremely tangentially, uh, a little bit about his poetry in English that we worked on a few years ago. But uh, it's interesting how to me, uh, but obviously this is something that we can talk about a lot more today, he seemed to be very much in touch with a certain line of British culture. So perhaps the more traditional, uh, like the one I have been talking about. Um, I wonder how uh, competent he was about the new developments. Like the, basically, William Archer thought of himself and the authors he championed as the avant-garde, going into a completely different direction. And I wonder how much Pessoa probably because of his uh, instruction, his preparation, his schooling, he, see, he always seems to be a lot more on the same wavelength with uh, the 19th century in Britain up to a certain point, up maybe to the great Victorians, up to someone like Swinburne, for instance. And when things begin to sort of move into different directions in the 1880s, in the 1890s, uh, with aestheticism and then Ibsenism, uh, probably, he might have known those things, but he found them slightly sort of unfamiliar or, or not uh, within his own, uh, let's say, cultural dimension. So I guess that uh, probably if he had finished it and sent it to a British publisher, if he'd found a publisher that was still sort of um, banking on these sort of more retro projects, uh, then he might have had a chance. But if he'd sent it to William Archer for an opinion, I think he would have got it back like straight in the post, f fundamentally. But let's not forget that uh, Archer was really fighting against a strong, strong kind of resistance against novelty. So the, the reason why he was so polemical and so aggressive also in the way he judged these, document, th th these products was because it's really a phase of transition uh, when uh, the new uh, becomes more visible, more evident, much later. In the early decades of the 20th century, there was this kind of sort of different planes sliding one on the other, uh, the more sort of traditional backward looking and the more experimental as always. But at this point in time, the tradition was still so strong and so prestigious as well. You know, the great Victorian tradition of, of drama and poetry and the novel as well, it was still blocking many new developments. So I guess if it played his cards right, uh, he might have had a chance, probably. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions from... No? Okay. Teresa, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I would just add very briefly, I won't talk about uh, Archer in my uh, talk, <laughs> um, but um, I think like um, Jeronim was saying that Psoe read Archer much in this um, rationalist, um, uh, interesting in this rationalist movement, because um, we have one sentence, I think I shared it with you, uh, in the private library in one of Mobius' um, um, uh, uh, title, that uh, designate um, theatre from Ibsen and also from North Europe as um, a theatre from a, a hospital. And Pessoa adds just a Nordalwesk. So he agrees. 
so he's not really into, um, or, or at least at this point when he wrote this note, is <laughs> uh, not into this um, this kind of theater. I suppose it's a it's a different uh, it, for him. Archer and um, uh, rationalist is a, a different uh, uh, matter of interest, and probably in theater he will collect some I ideas uh, from these movements, but in a different style. Yeah. Okay. That's all. Also a quick note, uh, because I think Pessoa read uh, Nordau, Max Nordau, the Jagaini songs. So he, he found Ibsen in Nordau's book and that was a disaster. So I mean, he was, um, he knew about Ibsen as he knew very late about Pirandello, but he was much more uh, touched by Metrolink and other uh, but Ibsen, I think uh, it was very important, it could have been very important for Pessoa, but it was very destroyed uh, by the book, by Nordal. And, and he, uh, well, and there were not so many translations, so he, yeah. He, he, I think he did not have like a direct knowledge of uh, some place by Ibsen. <laughs> 